I can see there's no shortage of interest and anxiety in Princeton. <laughs> well, we're here to talk about the most common emotional disorder in the world. According to sources like the World Health Organization, anxiety ranks number one in 16 out of 17 countries recently surveyed on various health indices including the United States, and in the one country where it wasn't number one, it was number two behind depression. We think that about 25% uh, of the population will have at some point in their lifespan a diagnosable anxiety condition that would benefit from professional help. At any one point in time, such as today, the numbers vary based on the sources, but I'd say 15 to 20% already have it. This does not include the percentage of people who are abusing drugs or alcohol who are self-medicating their anxiety. If we took the percentage of, from that group and added it to the anxiety numbers, it would probably be even bigger. I recently learned that if the Obamacare Health Act was repealed and replaced, and you were no longer, and you could be restricted from buying health insurance based on a pre-existing condition, I read the top 10 pre-existing conditions. Medical and emotional combined, number one, anxiety. If you ever had, had treatment or took medication for anxiety, you would not be able to buy health insurance, or at least you could be ruled out. So anxiety was number one. Number two, acne. <laughs> Cancer was 10, depression was seven. Obesity was pretty high, about six on the list. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder was like eight, but anxiety was the number one. So we're talking about a huge epidemic that seems to be increasing. So what I want to share with you today is, is a way of understanding anxiety that explains who gets it, when it happens, the conditions under which it happens, but most importantly, what you can do as a parent to be helpful, to help reduce and maybe even prevent to some degree anxiety. I call it the three ingredients framework for understanding anxiety, and I hope it makes sense to you. So let's start with three words that are often used interchangeably with respect to anxiety. First word that uh, people often use when they're talking about anxiety is fear. I have a feeling everyone in the room knows what fear is, right? Is the instinctive survival mechanism to cope with clear or present danger. So it's a high arousal state involving the release of many hormones. Most people think of it in terms of an adrenaline reaction. It prepares you to fight, flee, or freeze depending on your species. Fear is a reaction to clear or present danger. Anxiety, in a very general sense, could be thought of as the fear response, the fear reaction, when there's no actual danger or threat, when there's a perception of danger or threat. I'll give you an example. I'm on a stage, I'm talking to a group of people. You look like nice people. I don't feel particularly threatened, but I know that for some of you to come up here, stand on the stage, be exposed, be seen, could raise a lot of anxiety and yet there's no actual danger or threat, at least not so far. <laughs> the third word that people often use interchangeably with anxiety is stress. You hear, you hear your, your children or your teens say, I feel stressed out, and sometimes it's stress, but sometimes it's anxiety. And stress, as you'll see in a moment when I share with, this, with you this three ingredients way of thinking about anxiety, is the when factor. It's the condition under which anxiety symptoms emerge in people who have two other ingredients. Let's take a look at them, see if this makes sense. In a way, it all starts with genetics. There is a 
a biological sensitivity that about 20% of infants have at birth. Biological sensitivity. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by biological sensitivity. Let me start with um, my daughter. When she was young, she refused to wear socks that had a seam that goes under the toe. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Tube socks only? And we had to cut the labels off her clothes. Anybody have one of those? Do you know you can't buy pajamas in the United States of America for children that are not impregnated with a flame retardant chemical? It's a law. She wouldn't wear store-bought pajamas, at least not in the US. She could just feel it, you know? Some people use the term sensory processing sensitivity, which I think overlaps with this biological sensitivity. Yeah, we had to go to Montreal to buy pajamas for her. <laughs> now, Montreal isn't that far from Burlington, Vermont, but nevertheless, we had to leave the country to buy pajamas for my baby. Who blames it on me? And she's right, because I have it. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I carry healthy snacks in my backpack because I have to eat about every three hours, otherwise they start trembling. Biological sensitivity. I'm going to show you the names of two books that might be of interest if you want a little more depth on this quality, this temperament. I call it a sensitive temperament. The Highly Sensitive Child by Elaine Aron, who's a psychologist, and then a more recent book called Orchids, or The Orchid and the Dandelion. And which, which flower do you think uh, relates to biological sensitivity? <laughs> the orchids. Why some children struggle and how all can thrive. Biological sensitivity. So that's the first ingredient. And just because you have it doesn't mean you're going to develop anxiety, but it's one of those conditions that sets you up. The second ingredient are some personality traits that we find common in anxious children and the adults they become because personality, we believe, is stable over time. The good news is we don't have to change personality in order to manage anxiety, and we probably couldn't even if we wanted to. So what are some of the personality traits that we find common in anxious children, teens, and the adults they become? Oh, by the way, I just wanted to share one uh, photograph with you. If you have one of these biologically sensitive children, I've got good news for you. They grow up to be awesome. <laughs> this is that same girl who's now the director of a nonprofit organization in Boston. I'm very proud of her. So these are the personality traits that I'm referring to. These children tend to be, they have high standards and they can be, they can be responsible and dependable but a bit perfectionistic at times, and they have difficulty relaxing. They're very creative warriors. They can think of all the things that could go wrong. They like to please. They don't like conflict, so they're conflict avoidant. Sometimes they'll have issues with assertiveness and speaking up for themselves. They don't like to make waves. They don't like it when people are upset with them. And they're much more comfortable under structured conditions when they know what to expect. I can tell you right now, the formula for anxiety is ambiguity, uncertainty, and unpredictability, which is, in effect, the world that we're living in. And I think that's one reason why anxiety is so common. You don't have to raise your hand, but I suspect that some of you in the audience can identify with this personality style. I'll be the first to admit it. Since I have it, it can't be all bad, so what's good about it? Well, speaking of children, students in particular, uh, some of the most high-achieving, motivated students are the anxious ones. And they're cooperative and thoughtful, and, and teachers love them, and don't necessarily know they're anxious, because you can't see anxiety. You can see manifestations of anxiety. You can see it in mood, and you can see it in somatic symptoms tummy aches, and you can see it in terms of sleep disturbance, and sometimes in behavior. 
So they could be the high achieving, good students that teachers don't necessarily recognize as anxious. On the downside, of course, they're experiencing more stress and more anxiety than the average or the peer group. And they're suggestible. I mean, they're easily affected by their environment, both physical and also social. And unfortunately, they're more vulnerable to exploitation by less sensitive peers. And this is what I call the assets and the liabilities of the anxiety personality style. In my book, Dancing with Fear, I've created and published a self-test for adults to determine the degree to which you match this personality style. I haven't come up one, with one yet for children, but stay tuned. So that's the second ingredient. So if we go back now, we have two ingredients. We have the genetic ingredient, and then we have the learned qualities. In psychology, we think that personality forms as a result of the interaction between your temperament and your early life experiences, typically within the family and community. Anyone in the room who has more than one child would agree that each child comes into the world with their own, their own temperament, right? No two alike. And some of them are these sensitive, biologically sensitive children, about 20%. So what we're looking at now is an anxiety condition waiting to happen. What's going to trigger it? Stress. And the research on stress tells us a few things that might be of interest to you. One is that the effects of stress are cumulative. They add up over time. And the other finding is that the effects of stress often hit us in a delayed way, often after the stress is resolved. So sometimes when children become anxious, it isn't necessarily in response to something that's happening that day or that week even, but rather what's been happening in the past many weeks and months. In fact. The delay can be up to one year, 12 months. So when children are referred to my practice with anxiety, we want to know what's been happening in the life of that young person and in the family life of that young person within the past year or so. And I always ask the following question in every first interview in my practice. Have there been any unusual changes or stresses in your life within the past year or so? If it's apparent, I might say, have there been any unusual stresses or changes in your family life within the past year or so? And much to my surprise, I guess, many people don't have any perspective on how much stress they're experiencing. Why do you think people who I, as a professional, would recognize as highly stressed wouldn't recognize it themselves? Well. Sometimes it's because that's just the way life is for them. That's like normal life. So they don't have any perspective. It's just like how it is. This is important because what this framework tells us is wh what we can do to be helpful, and I'm going to be making some suggestions and recommendations tonight, is starting with, well, let me work backwards. The, the most obvious thing that this tells us is if we can teach our children to manage stress, we can control anxiety. Now, Headmaster Steve Murray, when he introduced me, didn't tell you that, although he asked me at dinner, he says, what, what drew you to this specialty in anxiety? And I said, well, I was a worried child. I had several forms of anxiety. I grew up anxious. One reason I was so anxious is because I grew up in New York City. And my neighborhood was known as Hell's Kitchen, <laughs> which is not a cooking reality television program, but rather a culturally diverse community in which I was a minority white boy in a primarily Puerto Rican and African American community. And I experienced the many of the risk factors for anxiety. Divorce, my parents divorced when I was 10. I was exposed to violence at an early age. This community was a violent community. If you don't know the west side of Manhattan back in the 1950s and 60s, hopefully you've seen West Side Story. How many of you have seen West Side Story? That was my neighborhood. 
exposure to violence at an early age. And interestingly to me, the world that children are growing up in today is also violent, but it's in a very different way. And it has to do with the media making global events feel like local events. It could be a school shooting, a terrorist attack at a concert or a sporting event. It's, and it's, it's in HD, flat screen, in your face. It feels like it's in real time, too. So there's an interesting parallel. But one reason that I can stand here and testify, so to speak, that I'm no longer anxious is because I practice what I preach and I have my own personal stress management program. So that's the first take-home message. Learning to manage stress will help control anxiety. With respect to biological sensitivity, there are four recommendations that I'm gonna make. I'll talk about them in a little more detail, but let me just give you a little heads up. Number one, and you're gonna wonder, you mean, to, you, mean you brought this psychologist all the way to Princeton to tell you that your children should get more sleep? Well, guess what? I'm going to give you four behavioral health recommendations that in and of themselves would make a huge difference. How many hours of sleep are teenagers supposed to get according to, per night according to the American Academy of Pediatrics? Anybody want to guess? Nine to ten. A recent survey of high school students found that 90% of them said they rarely get more than six hours of sleep on school nights. And 92% said they really get a good night's sleep. So I did the math. I have five school nights, three hours sleep deficit per night. That's a 15 hour sleep deficit per week. And I have been effective, or hell, uh, let's say put it this way. Therapy has been effective with sometimes with just these behavioral health recommendations. So getting enough sleep, which is a challenge because we're trying to do so much, right, in the time we have. So time management becomes a stress management skill that also can have a positive effect on sleep. So sleep, diet and nutrition, we could have a whole evening on diet and nutrition, but I'll just give you a couple of suggestions. One would be, dietitians tell us the best way to eat, the healthiest way to eat for all of us, but especially for the biologically sensitive people, is we should eat more often smaller amounts of food, like four or five times a day to keep our blood sugar level more consistent because the biologically sensitive children are more sensitive. I don't know if I said this earlier, but I should have if I didn't. The 20% of infants who are born more sensitive are more sensitive to external stimuli like lights and sounds and temperature and also internal sensations like fluctuations in blood sugar level, fatigue, tension. So obviously, uh, diet and nutrition could have some bearing on this, right? Uh, for example, there are energy drinks that are popular with young people. You know the names of them, right? Red Bull being sort of the most common one, but there are 135 milligrams of caffeine in six ounces of regular coffee. Or if you're from New York, it's coffee. <laughs> coffee. You can always tell a New Yorker because they say coffee. Well, guess what? There's more than 135 milligrams of caffeine in some of the youth-oriented energy drinks. And the worst ones are the two-ounce ones at the end cap in the grocery store, like 250 milligrams of caffeine. Not indicated for anxious or sensitive young people. Aqua Blast, Java water, they're all basically caffeinated waters, flavored caffeinated water. So diet and nutrition could be another thing to look at. What do you think I'm going to say next? Okay, we got sleep, we got diet, nutrition, we're going to talk about exercise, physical activity to release tension and also the synergistic effect of sleep, um, pardon me, on exercise on sleep. Some schools, particularly the public schools, in response to a terrible piece of legislation known as no child left on his behind, have eliminated the frills, and I'm talking like phys ed and music 
in art. I mean, how misguided is it to take away all the pressure relief valves from childhood? So exercise, and I'll even make the case for outdoor exercise, because we now know from brain research that exposure to the rhythms of nature, light and dark cycles and seasonal cycles, actually helps to reset our internal rhythms. And all you have to do is ask yourself, where do you like to go on vacation? And it'll probably be someplace outdoors, some natural environment. The fourth recommendation, you're not going to like this one. Don't shoot the messenger. But the American Academy of Pediatrics has made some recommendations about children's media exposure. The same study of high school students found when they, asked, when they were asked, what are you doing in the one hour before you go to sleep at night? They virtually all were exposed to something that looks like this. Electronic screens, video consoles, LED televisions, smartphones. Turns out that the light emitted by these things, these screens, is highly stimulating to the human brain, which in itself isn't the problem. But how many hours per week are children between the ages of 8 and 18 exposed to the light from electronic screens, now known as blue light, short wavelength bluish light? Anybody want to guess hours per week? We could do it per day, but they publish the per week hours. I'll start a bid, OK? 10 hours a week, going once. Give me a number. 30, we got 30 going once. 30 going twice. 40, we got, we got 40 going once. 40 going twice. <laughs> okay, let's back down. It's 49. Let's do a little math, okay. Seven days a week, 49 hours a week, that's an average of seven hours a day. But that isn't the problem in itself either. The problem is when the sun goes down. The human brain produces hormones like serotonin, you know that brain hormone that is associated with energy and positive mood? And melatonin, the brain hormone that induces drowsiness and the production of those hormones in the human brain is light regulated. So when the sun comes up in the morning, the brain starts producing serotonin, you start to you know, get your energy up, when the sun goes down, reverse. Well, guess what? If you are exposed to an electronic screen after the sun goes down, your brain doesn't know what time of day it is and will delay the production of the melatonin hormone. And that's why Starbucks is opening one new coffee shop every single day somewhere in the world. Because we're sleep deprived. And one reason we're sleep deprived is because we don't feel sleepy even though we're tired because we're exposed to this stimulating light. And I'm not even talking about content. I'm just talking about the light. So, as I said, you might not like this, but the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that you turn off all electronic screens one hour before bedtime. I love my technology. But as an experiment, try this. For a period of one week, turn off all electronic screens 30 minutes before bed. Just as an experiment and see what happens. I won't predict the results, but I've given you the basis for the experiment. See what happens. So those are some of the implications of this way of understanding anxiety. Personality traits like worrying and so on, we deal with that in the context of going through the anxiety disorder. So let's take a look at that and see if we can get a handle on the different forms of anxiety. How would you recognize if one or more of your children was manifesting some form of anxiety? Well, these are some of the symptoms of anxiety. With, with school settings, avoidance, avoidance of sometimes even avoid school refusal or school avoidance, social avoidance, those would be some clues that there might be some anxiety driving it. Worry and indecisiveness. Difficulty making decisions, typically because you don't want to make a bad decision or a mistake, so maybe you 
don't make any decisions or you have difficulty making decisions. We know that anxiety can affect attention and concentration and memory. And so when there's a problem with attention or concentration or memory, it might be anxiety driving it. It, it might look like an attention deficit disorder but it also might be an anxiety disorder manifesting in terms of impairment in attention and concentration. Frequent somatic complaints, tummy aches, and of course difficulty sleeping would be clues. S difficulty separating beyond about the sixth year of life. We think that it's considered normal for children up to the sixth year of life to experience anxiety or fear in relation to separating from their security base, you guys, the parents and guardians. Of course, I would say that not all of the apples fall off the tree at the same time, even though they're all ripe when they fall. And so some kids come to school, they haven't really overcome or mastered the separation issue. You might see that in the younger grades, but then I see it sometimes with young people who have already overcome it, but then under stress will regress to an earlier stage of development and then show up with separation issues and clinginess. Sometimes behavior problems are really anxiety disorders in disguise. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you are planning an activity uh, that involves social interaction and you have a child who's socially anxious. So that means that that activity, and this could happen in a school setting too, as well as in a home setting <clears throat> or community, that child's anxiety might go up and as a way of, of managing the anxiety, that young person might want to avoid the situation because by the way, avoidance is the most common coping mechanism for anxiety. Keep that in mind. Avoidance is just the most natural, instinctive way to manage anxiety. It doesn't work in the long run. It only works in the short run. So if you have social anxiety and you're invited to a party and your anxiety goes up and you decide not to go, your anxiety goes down. But that doesn't really solve the problem, right? It just sort of perpetuates it. So back to behavior, you've got a child who's acting out or manifesting a behavior problem, refusal. It could look like oppositional defiant disorder, which is the term we use in some cases. And yet what it might be is simply a young person's attempt to manage their anxiety through avoidance. It might be helpful for you to think of behavior as a form of communication. Does that make sense? But maybe our children don't always have the language skills to communicate their feelings, so they'll act them out. Let me give you a, a, another personal example. When that same girl, about that same age, our family planned a ski trip. Now, we live in Burlington, Vermont. We could have gone skiing at Stowe or Sugarbush or Jay Peak. No, we're going to go to Killington, the big mountain. So we book a vacation, one week trip to Killington. We talked about it with the kids, everybody's on board. And a couple of days before the, the, we were scheduled to leave, she says she doesn't want to go. We said, well, you know, we made the commitment. The deposit has been made. We're going. No, she starts having a temper tantrum on the kitchen floor. Now, we have a tiled kitchen floor, right? She's having a temper tantrum on the floor. We don't give in. We don't over-accommodate. We said, you know, because remember, no, I can't say remember because I didn't tell you this yet, but the solution to anxiety is to face the situation using some skills rather than avoiding it. Remember, avoiding is the natural coping mechanism. The better way is to learn some skills to face the anxiety. So she's having a temper tantrum on the floor. I mean, wailing. We're going, so we go on the trip. At the end of the week, we go to the children's center at Killington to pick her up and her sister, and she doesn't want to go home. And we said, well, we got to go home, and the week's up. She has the same temper tantrum on the snow, and then I got it. Oh, she's trying to talk to us 
with her behavior. She doesn't like changes. But she, she couldn't say. Um, I'm really uncomfortable with changes. I like predictability and, and you know. <laughs> so I'm having a hard time with this. So she's acting out her feelings. Depression correlates highly with anxiety, particularly with worriers, because worry, this is a concept that some of you may be familiar with, especially if there are any counselors or therapists in the group. Uh, there was an idea that came out in about the 1980s that is now the basis of a certain form of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. And the, and the idea was that how we feel is determined primarily by what we're thinking and how we're thinking. So if we worry, we're going to feel anxious. And if we think negatively, we're going to feel depressed. But guess what? Almost all worries are negative. Do you ever wake up in the morning saying, what if I have a great day? <laughs> uh, students don't say, what if I pass the test in school tomorrow, then what? So by definition, worries are negative, and so there's a very high potential for depression co-occurring with anxiety. Sometimes worriers present as depressed and, and exhausted. One of, if you, in our official diagnostic system, one of the signs of what's called generalized anxiety disorder, which I might as well show you now, is exhaustion and fatigue. Worriers often look depressed and apathetic and have low energy and low motivation, but it's not because they're lazy, it's because they're worriers, and not only are they spending a lot of energy in worrying, but it often affects their sleep. So worriers typically have what we call non-restorative sleep. Even if they're in bed for the whole time of the eight or the nine to 10 hours, they're not really sleeping restoratively. So depression could be another clue about anxiety. Obviously self-harm and eating issues and drug use could also be a clue that you might be, uh, there might be some anxiety driving these behaviors. Well, these are the official terms for the anxiety conditions. Rather than take you uh, through a detailed nature walk through the anxiety disorders, let me just say that every one of them is on a continuum. And there's like almost a normal end and then there's the abnormal end. And I'll just give you a few examples. Let's take social anxiety disorder. Children who are shy and emotionally inhibited, which is not a diagnosis, are at risk for developing social anxiety disorder. But where is the line between one and the other? I can tell you that children who do not have an anxiety condition also worry. There are what we call normal worries of childhood and adolescence. And these are the normal worries. 5,000 children in five US uh, cities in this study, and this is what they found. The number one concern was school performance. That shouldn't surprise anybody who lives in Princeton. School performance. But that doesn't mean they have an anxiety disorder. Second biggest concern is appearance, which is probably related to number three, social acceptance, right? And then something bad happening to a parent, something bad happening to a friend, and then what I call global concerns. And I've heard all kinds of worries from kids terrorism, nuclear destruction, and most surprisingly recently, climate change. Kids are worrying about climate change. Now what's the line between normal worry and abnormal worry? Well, the degree to which anxiety affects your ability to function in daily life is the line between the normal end and the abnormal end. How, and how does worry affect your life? Remember, it affects attention and concentration and memory, and it can affect sleep. So now you're tired and exhausted. That's when you've crossed the line. So that would be another example of this continuum. Another example might be, whoops, obsessive compulsive disorder. Now there are people who are neat and organized. And I, I think I'm in that category. 
I don't think I have obsessive compulsive disorder, but you could see how one could bleed into the other, where everything has to be just right, and you'll sacrifice sleep and social life. And I know you have some, some of your, your children, some students, who are so perfectionistic and have to have things just right that they'll sacrifice their health in the process. They're crossing the line. Now it's, it's abnormal, it might, it's a problem, it might need some attention, maybe some professional help. I think it's time to start talking about parents and what you could do to be helpful. So I'm gonna show you what I call the um, helpful and unhelpful parenting styles. Counterproductive or productive. You've heard the terms, right? Helicopters, bulldozers. I thought that snowplow parenting was a uniquely Vermont thing <laughs> until I read it in the literature, but I've got a new one for you. Hot off the press, concierge parenting. <laughs> That's what Steve Murray was talking about with the little engine that was waiting for the, the parents to push him up. They're all variations of the same theme, over indulging, over-involved, doing too much, and it comes from here. It's, it's the right thing in the wrong way, maybe would be one way to say it. It's coming from here. It's just a natural instinct, right, to protect our children, to want them to be successful. Let's talk about what might be more helpful. I've got three, three questions for you. I'm talking about your purpose as a parent. So now this is the interactive part of this evening, okay? I don't know if you've thought about this, but the first question is, what is the goal of parenting? What are you trying to do? Those of you who are raising children, I'm sure most of you have children, what's your purpose, your goal? To make them? Independent. We're going to start a little vocabulary list, and that's going to be on the list. Uh, other, I'm sure other parents can relate to that, right? You want your children to become independent, right? Okay, what else? Raise your hand so I can see you. Successful. Self-sufficient. Self sort of a variation of independence. Self-sufficient, successful. Responsible. Happy, what a concept. They should be happy. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not. Supported? Your, 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 your purpose is to raise your children to be supported? Supportive, okay. As in relationships with other people. Say that again? Thoughtful and kind, and compassionate, and maybe moral. Okay. Productive. Okay, we got independent, we got self sufficient, we've got happy, we've got successful, right? Caring, moral, healthy. The best they can be. I like that one because. We're going to come back to that. The best they can be. Keep that one in mind. Socially effective. Socially effective. In order to be socially effective, you have to have what? That's the second, the second question is what skill? First of all, before I even ask you the second question, I just want to throw out this question. How would you know? How would you know if your children were independent, or happy, or successful, or compassionate? What would you need to see that would give you feedback that you've done a good job, you've been successful as a parent? Healthy relationships. Healthy relationships, okay. Now here's where it starts to get interesting. The second question is what skills and experiences will your children need in order to become independent? and successful, and happy, and self-sufficient, and moral, and kind, and have good relationships, etc. cetera. What, what do they need to experience? Failure. Oh.
you think your children should experience failure in order to be successful. Yeah. Because guess what? The world out there isn't going to accommodate them the way you may. They're not going to get what they want when they want it like they have from you guys if you're concierge parents or helicopter parents and all the other variations. So that's a very important idea that you have to step back and allow your children to have experiences from which they'll learn the skills that will enable them to be independent and happy and to become the best they can be because guess what? You don't necessarily know as a parent what their best is going to be, right? It's a process of discovery. Our, our instinct is like we think we know what they should do in order to be happy and that's the real challenge in a way of parenting is to let go and let your children have the experiences from which they'll learn the skills. Like for example, how do you learn to make good decisions? You make some decisions, some of which might not be so good, and you have to allow your children to experience the natural consequences of the decisions they make in order for them to learn how to make good decisions. That's a hard one, right, because remember our instinct is to protect and care, but if we do too much of it, we're actually getting in our own way, interfering with our own success as parents. So that's an important concept. There's a whole genre of books now. I'll give you a couple of titles. One is called The Gift of Failure, How the Best Parents Learn to Let Go So Their Children Can Succeed, just as an example. I got three or four on a reading list that I give parents who are having trouble stepping back I've heard stories of parents calling college professors to complain about the grades their children were getting in college. I mean, there's so many different examples of, of parents who are doing too much, speaking for their children. That's a hard challenge, but I hope you get the idea. The third question, of course, is when do you start the process? of raising children to become independent and happy and successful and productive, etc. And the answer is, if you haven't already started right now, in any moment in which you're struggling with stepping back, this is connected to your goal as a parent. What else can you do to be helpful as a parent? Well, I already mentioned, so this is just a pop quiz question. You know, what are the four behavioral health recommendations that you might want to integrate into your family to manage that first ingredient in anxiety, that biological sensitivity, to create some structure and rhythms in the home. You know, research finds that the one thing that a family can do that would have the most positive effect on reducing anxiety, improving bonding to the family, Reducing susceptibility to negative peer influence, family dinners. It turns out that less than half, 40%, only 40% of American families have dinner together three times a week or more. That's less than half. Such a natural opportunity to be in the same place at the same time and communicate face to face and, and review and plan and connect. How about a bedtime? I mean, you know, we have rhythms in our bodies. We have circadian rhythms and metabolic rhythms, and we function at our optimally best when we live in accordance with our own rhythms, and that includes our circadian sleep cycles, a regular bedtime. I always work backwards, you know, when I'm helping parents with uh, managing time. I'll say something like, so what time does your child need to be in school in the morning? Anybody want to give me a number? Eight o'clock. So I say, how much time does it take for your child to get to school from your house? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay. So you gotta leave the house at 7.30 to be at school at eight. Uh, how much time do you need uh, between getting out of bed and leaving the house? That includes, you know, washing up and eating breakfast. An hour. So you have to be out of bed at 6.30 in order to be at school at 8. And you just keep winding back, you know, how much time do you need between being awakened and getting out of bed? And how many hours of sleep do you need per night? And how much time does it take to get, to, you know, after you text your friends before you fall asleep, you know? 
and all of a sudden bedtime's at like eight o'clock, you know, and nobody does that, right? But that's one way to think about it, that tomorrow is connected to tonight. Some people think, oh, tomorrow's another day. Well, it's, it's all connected, right? So I would remind you to remember your purpose, if that conversation made any sense, to keep that in mind, to counteract your impulse to step in and rescue. One of the best things you can do to help your children with their stress and anxiety is to manage your stress and anxiety. You are the, you are the role models. And how do you do that? Well, there's lots of ways to do that. I'll show you one way in a minute. And sometimes uh, it would be helpful when you see that your children have crossed the line and their anxiety is interfering with their ability to function in daily life, then maybe a referral for counseling might be appropriate. Maybe we can take a look in a, in a moment at what conditions might prompt you to be making such a, uh, taking such a step. Very briefly, just a way to think about managing stress is what I call the three-step process. The first is to recognize the symptoms of stress. Notice that anxiety could be considered a symptom of stress because in people who have the biological sensitivity and those personality traits that we talked about, under stress they might manifest anxiety. So anxiety could be thought of as a symptom of stress I should have been showing you this slide as I said that. You can see anxiety. So there's mood and there's behavior and then there are somatic symptoms of stress, right? It might be good to think about what are the sources of stress, especially if you can identify sources that you have some control over, some things we can't control. And there's a big issue in Princeton about competition for college admissions and a lot of anxiety on the part of parents and of course students about being successful according to the cultural norms and we may not be able to change that whole cultural system and that's a problem. There was a study done some years ago that compared Ivy League college graduates to non-Ivy League college graduates and there was a difference and cultural measures of success, income and prestige and so on. But then when they compared Ivy League college graduates to those who applied to Ivy League colleges and didn't get in and went somewhere else, there was no significant difference in their success level, suggesting that it wasn't the college or it isn't the college that makes you successful. So I was having this conversation at lunch today and one of the committee members from the Princeton Common Ground said, yeah, but Yale is on your resume. <laughs> I said, well, it actually wasn't the best fit for me because I went to Yale when it was an all-male school. I'm sorry if this is in any way offensive, but it was, and it, and it, was, a, it was a stellar educational experience and it was a terrible social experience. I spent virtually no time in New Haven, Connecticut. I was on the New Haven Railroad, Railroad every Friday going down to Greenwich Village in New York to hang out with my girlfriend. But yeah, it's on my resume, so I, I had to pause for a minute and say, yes, it's a perception. And, it's, it's, and we can't change that. I mean, that's, a, that's you know, Yale and you know, these Ivy League schools have been uh, in existence since like the 17th century. This is old stuff. So, some things we can't change, but some things we can. And now we're always looking for what we have control over, and then for those things we don't have control over, we're gonna to try to control our reactions to the things we can't control. But the goal here is to motivate you and your children to practice some stress management skills. And if we had time, we could talk about time management, Maybe during the question and answer session, if you're interested in my thoughts about a good framework for, for improving time management skills, I'm happy to share that. Learning how to set reasonable goals. Again, spending time outdoors. This is kind of a new term, green recreation. It's just a new 
way of saying spending time outdoors. Some people have actually said that childhood has moved indoors. It's not a good thing. Uh, we talked about structure in home life, uh, setting limits on the media exposure. We talked about that. Talking itself can be stress reducing. And then, of course, there are relaxation and <coughs> flow activities. I'm happy to speak to that during the question and answer period. We'll have about a half hour for that. I did say that it might be part of your job to recognize when your children need professional help. So these are my thoughts about the conditions under which you'd be thinking about, well, maybe at least an assessment to determine whether this is in the abnormal range and could benefit from some professional help. Anything under two weeks is transient. Some, we're talking about persistent symptoms that might benefit from some professional help. Frequent physical uh, symptoms or complaints, prolonged sleep problems that don't respond to behavioral health interventions and, and good sleep hygiene, changes in academic functioning, dramatic changes usually indicate something's going on. I see it a lot with the generalized anxiety condition that affects attention and concentration, so grades start going down. Avoidance would be another condition that I think you should take seriously. Behavior problems. That, don't, that can't be managed through understanding what the behavior is trying to say. Sadness, crying, depression, difficulty relaxing, certainly eating issues and self-harm. I'm talking things like cutting or even uh, drug and alcohol abuse uh, could be uh, conditions that, where you would be thinking about getting some help. What we do when you do refer someone to us is, you know, we, we are relationship-based, generally speaking, when we do therapy with young people. And often we involve the parents, so parent support is usually part of our process when we do even individual counseling with children. We, we always want to involve the parents because we, always, we know that parents have more influence than a therapist or counselor. And if we're on board and we're a team, and even better when you got the school and the parents and the counselor all operating with the same goals and same strategies. We have different forms of therapy. Exposure therapy would be an example. Happy to talk about that. And we teach self-regulation skills. We teach children how to relax, how to be in control of their mind and their body. So with that, and someone asked me during, before we started, I was talking to a parent who was asking about medication. I usually don't start with medication, but when counseling isn't effective within a reasonable period of time, three, four months, then I start thinking about maybe we should revisit the treatment plan. And maybe a medication evaluation might be appropriate at that point. Not a good long-term solution typically, but can be often extremely helpful to support children getting the most out of counseling. So it's now about 8.39, 8.40. We've been at this about an hour. Gives us a little time to see if I've made any sense. If you have any questions, any comments, any examples of anything that I've talked about, I'd, I'd be happy to hear. Yes? Uh, have you found any correlation between children or people in general uh, who have any sort of allergies, food allergies, seasonal allergies, where you're sort of allergic or your body can react to the surrounding environment. Have you found a correlation between that and high level of anxiety? Everybody hear that? The answer is yes. There is in fact a diagnosis, which wasn't on the list, but I could have put it on the list, called anxiety due to a medical condition. When there is a bona fide diagnosable medical, medical condition, which can include allergies, tree nut allergies, for absolutely, because the potential for severe reactions, and remember, the formula for anxiety is ambiguity, unpredictability, and uncertainty, so when you don't know, I've even heard of cases where, I can think of a couple of examples, um, I was on a JetBlue flight, and I heard a sort of a fuss several rows ahead of me, and there was a passenger saying, 
to the flight attendant as she was passing out peanuts. You don't understand. I, I specifically called the airlines. There, there must be supposed to be any peanuts served on this airlines. You don't understand. I could die. Now, I happen to have a peanut butter bagel sandwich in my backpack. And I had to decide, how far away do I need to be <laughs> to not kill this person with my sandwich? But it really, it really made me think, this is, this is, that was anxiety. This, this woman was freaking out. I've heard of schools, you know, where there's policy issues around, you know, bringing in tree nuts. So absolutely, yes. And it could be diabetes, it involves, you know, insulin. Any medical condition that involves pain or relapse can trigger anxiety. Absolutely. So short answer is yes. Question in the back. Have you seen an increase in diagnoses in ADD or ADHD as anxiety is being more prevalent? Have I seen an increase in the, the use of the diagnosis ADHD and ADD? And the answer is yes. Now the question is really how does it connect with anxiety, right? There are certain diagnoses that have changed over time, but they're all referring to the same behaviors. And I go back enough in my career to remember when there was a diagnosis, was a terrible diagnosis called MBD, minimal brain damage, that morphed into attention deficit disorder. And there are new diagnoses that they're all referring to some quality that we don't quite understand. But you could have both conditions. They're two distinct conditions, but anxiety could look like attention deficit disorder. The good news is there are screening tools and assessment tools that can help make that distinction. They're basically, they're basically they're behavior rating scales. Parents can fill them out. Teachers can fill them out. And they're normed, so you can get some good data. And I would say if you have a child where that's a question, you can get some information that will help you know where you are and then therefore what treatment would be appropriate. Yes. Could you please speak to trends that you've seen in your career for girls and for boys, gender specific? Are there, uh, let's see if I can reframe that. Are there gender differences in either the prevalence of anxiety or the way anxiety manifests? Thank you. And the answer is yes. And the, the research says that anxiety, that, and this is, this is very nuanced because I'll, I'll tell you why I, I think this, how we need to interpret this, that anxiety is more common in girls than boys. Mo boys are more likely to act out. We call them externalizers and girls are more likely to act in or we call them internalizers. But I don't really buy it because I, what I think is that it has to do with cultural norms around how we manifest stress and for boys there's more of a barrier to asking for help or even acknowledging help. I'll give you an example. Uh, some years ago I went on the radio in Vermont. It was a call-in show. It was, called, it was a Vermont public radio show called Switchboard. They did a talk about anxiety and people could call in. Now I'm a male psychologist. Okay, I got a lot of calls from men. I'm talking hockey coaches. When they heard a man talking about his anxiety, because I already told you my story, right? They were calling up and they were coming in for counseling. But that is not the norm. The norm is, no, uh, that's the sign of weakness. Uh, being a scaredy cat being fearful. Real men don't cry. So there's all that cultural gender training. I still think it's in the culture. Hopefully it's changing. And um, real men have feelings and can learn how to be good communicators and have emotional intelligence. But yeah, the, the gender differences therefore don't necessarily reflect the actual prevalence of anxiety, but the way that it's, the way it manifests. So I hope that I hope that speaks to it. Yes. My question is about um, the media, specifically screen time, um, and the 
obsession with these communal video games like Fortnite. Um, and the strong reaction um, that we get as parents when we try and curb that in, is there any advice that you can give to, to try and remediate that situation? Okay. Here's how I would think about addressing that. The first thing is to be clear about what your expectations are in terms of performance, both health, social, and academic. If your child can meet your expectations in these three areas and still play, spend time on the video games, I say, what's the problem? But usually it doesn't work that way, but that's how you start. You say, here's what I expect as a parent, okay? And I'm gonna leave it up to you, but here we have an agreement that if you can't meet those expectations, then something has to give and maybe we have to reevaluate how much time you get on, on those games or that exposure to the, the immediate exposure. Does that make sense? You, you sort of work backwards from, and you're giving control over, but you sort of predetermine with the young person what it will mean if they can't keep it up. That really, I've, I've, I think that really helps parents too because your goal, you already know what your goals are, right? Um, I don't know if this is a good example, but let me just flip it around. I've had parents express concern because uh, one parent would say, well, my daughter, when she comes home from school, all she wants to do is, is uh, read in her room. And I say, well, how is she doing in school? Oh, fine, she's got good grades. Well, does she, how about friends? Does she have friends? Does she have a social life? Oh, yeah, she's on the soccer team. Um, any health concerns? No. I say, what's the problem? And the problem is we're afraid she's going to become like a social recluse. And I'm thinking, guess what? There are some people, and this is a new idea about introversion and extroversion. You know, the old idea was that um, introverts were like, socially anxious, uncomfortable around people, shy and inhibited, and extroverts were gregarious and friendly and comfortable around people. Turns out, as a result of some new research and a number of books like Quiet and The Introvert Advantage, that the difference between introverts and extroverts is not how comfortable we are around people, but how we recover from spending time with people. And introverts are like rechargeable batteries. You know, they've got to like go into their charger and extroverts are like solar panels, you know, they like collect. <laughs> so when I read that, I realized I'm an introvert. Would you have guessed that? What am I gonna do when I get back to Vermont after this lecture? I'm probably gonna, depending on the weather, I'm gonna either go for a long bike ride by myself, maybe go for a ski, maybe play my guitar. I'm gonna get away from people. Don't take it personally, I love you. <laughs> but if I don't get my time, I'm probably gonna like get a little irritable. So, you see what I'm saying? If it's not affecting their functioning in the areas that are important to you, then don't make a power struggle out of it. But set it up so that they agree that if it's not working, that they're, they're agreeing to give it up. Um, I had sort of a follow-up to that last question, um, something that came up as you were speaking earlier about, I don't know if trigger is the right word, but in terms of exposure to violence um, as a trigger for anxiety developing. And if you had um, an opinion or seen any studies looking at the exposure of violent video games specifically in terms of uh, kids being that are more like sensitive kids being more sensitive to that and how that works. Before video games became popular there was a, a meta-analysis of hundreds of studies about the effect of television viewing on children. So I'm going to start with that. Children who watched two or more hours of television per day were more likely to exhibit three effects. One was more aggressive behavior. Because, more aggressive behavior. Because there's a tremendous amount of violence in the media. And I'm even talking about Saturday morning cartoons that have been studied and it's been found that there's an average of like 46 violent acts per hour 
on Saturday morning children's cartoons. And of course, it's in video games now, right? Grand Theft Auto, Vice City, where a player can hire a prostitute and kill her to boost his energy reserves. How about, I'm almost afraid to say this one. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of this game where the lead character mutters racist and sexist slurs while urinating and pouring gasoline on women and minorities before setting them on fire. Some branches of our military teach soldiers how to kill using commercially available video games. Now the APA, the American Psychological Study, found that exposure to violence in the media, increased aggressive behavior, it also increased anxiety, more fearfulness of the world around us, and third, less sensitivity to the feelings of other people. So I used to go around saying, if you want your children to become more aggressive, more anxious, and less sensitive to the feelings of other people, just have them watch two or more hours of television per day. Now I have to back that out and say, this could have involved video games. On the other hand, Video games, video game playing, if we put content aside for a minute, can be a flow activity. It can be a calming tension release and, and even some video games are used as cognitive priming activities before math lessons, for example, but we're not talking about violent video games. But there is a tremendous amount of violence, I think I understand your question, but there's no question in my mind, children learn primarily by imitation, and when they're exposed to violence in the media, guess what? It's been well documented, so I don't think there's any question about that. The question is then, how do you manage it? How do you manage children's media exposure? There are some websites like commonsensemedia.org, it's a non-commercial website that uh, provides um, recommendations for appropriateness based on age for television, movies, video games. At what point, though, you know, where you don't want to expose your children to some of these, these violent cartoons or violent shows that are on TV, or, but it, at what point do you have to almost expose them to some of it so you want to desensitize them a little bit to it? And, and, have them not freak out if they see a battle scene on CNN because they happen to walk in the room. Right. You know, where's that fine line? Right, right. And not only where's the fine line, but good luck trying to shelter them from exposure to it, even if you were to try to do it. Because they're going to, it's right there. I mean, you got news feeds, you know, that you can uh, sign, subscribe to. So. I think I understand your question. The question is, what is the, what is the lesson? Again, what's your purpose as a parent? What are you trying to help your children do in terms of functioning in the world in which there is a lot of violence? And ethnic violence, I mean, there's, there's, there's some realities too. We, we, I guess the best answer I could give you is use it as a teachable opportunity. Communicate about it. They're exposed, it's real, Let's talk about what it means, and, what, and by also, what is the probability of bad things happening to you or your family? Even though it feels like it's right around the corner, chances are low, but the consequences would be tragic. So I, I think that would be the best way. I need to stop you now. You need to stop me. Thank you very much for speaking to us. I guess it's time to say goodnight. Thank you.